great and uh, fully support all of your uh, activities when it comes to uh, um, developing a community around data science at the Polytechnical. Uh, I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, you can hopefully see my screen. Yes, we can see it. Yep, yep. Okay, uh, and I've got a, I've got about three slides I'm going to run through. Um, this is an ever-changing presentation on um, thesis project proposals that I um, have. Uh, just for those who have not um, heard my name before, uh, my name is. Uh, Mark Carmen. I'm an Associate Professor at the Polytechnical. Very lucky to be at such a, a great institution. I've been there three years now. Um, prior to that, I was, uh, I'm Australian and I've um, worked and lived in, in many different places, the United States, Switzerland, Italy for a very long time, and of course, various institutions in Australia. Um, my um, background is in information retrieval originally, but I sort of moved in uh, information retrieval and machine learning. Um, and now I would say I'm a data scientist uh, more than anything else. Um, you can see a uh, cartoon about data science there. Um, what do I work on recently? So uh, um, uh, recently, my f research focus has been in deep learning and explainable AI, um, uh, working on problems of analyzing social media. I'll talk about that, digital forensics and genomics. Um, so I thought that the easiest way to explain what projects I'd be interested to supervise would be to just give you a list of the projects I'm currently supervising, um, uh, because I think they're the, the is cleanest and clearest uh, expression of, um, of what I work on. Um, so here's the list and I wrote them down and uh, apologies to anybody I'm currently working with who I forgot to put you down. Because that's just because uh, it was a bit late in the day when I put down this list. Um, so di different projects I'm grouping in under different headings. Uh, image geolocation is one uh, where we work on uh, work with a student looker on geolocating outdoor images. We have a massive massive collection of uh, images and we train models to try to identify where those images might have been taken. Same for indoor images. Um, I had a thesis student in the past who's just finished and another student taking over the project in some sense uh, working on locating pictures of indoor images is particularly important for the police for identifying um, crimes that have committed, been committed or being committed indoors um, uh, sounds a bit big brother, but actually the types of crimes that we're trying to help the police um, target here are, uh, are nasty. So uh, the, what, the extent to which we can help them, the better. Um, and what we do there is um, it's not just deep learning, it's also explanations. Why do we think that this picture was taken uh, in um, uh, in southern Italy, well, it has to be in Italy because, uh, oh, yeah, sorry, it has to be in Europe because of the power plug, and it probably is in southern Italy because of the type of furniture we're seeing, things like that. Second group of um, projects are uh, around digital forensics, well, around the idea of identifying um, uh, deep fake content. People have, um, I'm sure, have heard of the term deep fakes. Uh, which is a manipulated video to make it look like somebody is in the video who wasn't actually there. Um, what we've been doing recently, and I'm going to show some demos in a second of uh, many of these applications, um, uh, generating textual descriptions of why a video might be fake. You know, there's something wrong with the nose, uh, the glasses aren't, aren't connected, two eyes have different colours, etc. Or um, looking at video level artefacts in the in the um, in the video itself, there's some flickering going on. Um, the the face, um, uh, there's some some inconsistencies between frames that we're able to pick up. Other types of projects that uh, recently, um, a lot of uh, a number of students working on visual question answering systems or captioning and visual question answering. So this is where we start with an image and we. Um, uh, extract information from it and then build a question answering system that is able to respond to questions about uh, that image. So uh, this is particularly interesting for medical scenarios where we have pictures of uh, radiography or um, 
uh, chest x-rays and the like and, and uh, the user would like to know what is wrong with this image or what, what is the uh, condition that it has and uh, we can respond with natural language. Another a student came to me recently and was very interested in uh, working with ECG signals, so um, heart um, uh, electrocardiogram signals and so we're um, doing the same sort of thing with question answering with um, uh, ECG signals. Uh, fact checking, something I work on a fair bit with different students, automatically checking. Um, uh, so there's a number of projects in this area. One is on um, trying to uh, check claims, uh, numeric claims that are being made. So some a, a politician might say that the um, uh, that the economy is the best it's been um, since uh, the Second World War, or the the, the maybe something more specific, the um, unemployment rate is the lowest it's been since the um, uh, since the 1970s, then we'd be able to check that. Uh, we'd attempt to check that automatically against time series data that's available in tables on the internet. Um, another student's working on satire detection, trying to understand uh, and detect differences between um, satirical news, fake news, and real news. And uh, our third student's just starting working on automated question answering systems and making use of them for fact checking. So if a statement is made by a politician, we turn it into a question and check with an automated question answering system whether that statement is actually can be proven or disproven based on uh, evidence found online. Uh, other types of projects, um, I, all of these projects are working with deep learning. Um, this, in this case, the data is different. It's genomic data, um, and we're looking at protein embeddings for drug repurposing, um, trying to understand uh, how a, a description of a drug and, and uh, how drugs and proteins bind, um, or what it is about the um, uh, description of the protein that allows us to identify um, which drugs might might interact with it. Um, and uh, another related project um, was looking more on the data integration of uh, so metadata, textual data describing genomic experiments, and we built a system uh, there for data integration uh, using deep learning techniques. It's very cool. Uh, then text and explainable AI. Um, generating text explanations for explaining why a model is making the predictions it is. So this might be uh, a medical diagnosis system. It's uh, diagnosing a patient as having a cardiovascular disease and the patient says, well, that's unpleasant. Why do I why do I um, do, do uh, why is the system predicting that I have cardiovascular disease? Uh, and we generate textual descriptions saying, well, in part it's the high blood pressure, in part it's the low uh, body mass index, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one project that's just starting off now uh, on a related note, not on uh, textual descriptions, but on generating text is uh, semi-automated script writing from a plot synopsis. So we're trying to see whether we can assist script writers to generate uh, scripts. Um, then, uh, another project uh, working with a, a student um, who's interested in um, security uh, is on malware detection, Android malware, and specifically where we decompile, we look at the source code for the malware, and we try to generate explanations as to why it might be uh, malware using a classifier. Uh, other deep learning technique uh, to, um, projects I've been working on uh, we have an, a pipeline for image-based social sensing, so where we collect data, f images from Twitter and other Flickr and other sources um, or, uh, uh, based on um, searches that a user might perform in order to then, uh, and we pass them, uh, maybe a, easiest to show rather than explain this, um, this pipeline, but it's used for um, uh, investigating um, news events and, and all, all sorts of different things online. Um, so students working on keyword suggestion there. Uh, I and other students working on mobile channel estimation with um, deep learning tools for mobile networks. And uh, there's a, another project ongoing with um, track monitoring using accelerometer data on commercial trains. So, uh, oh, and there was another project with, together with um, 
uh, a colleague, uh, Manuel Rovery, who um, uh, supervised a student looking at privacy preserving text classifiers using encryption. So all of these projects, um, uh, as a long list of projects that are ongoing and, and coming up uh, and, and starting and some of, uh, are finishing now, um, they all involve explainable AI and, or to, to the most part, they involve explainable AI. They all certainly involve deep learning. Um, many of them are multimodal, so we're looking at the um, integration of text and images together uh, or um, even uh, time series data um, and anomaly detection in some cases. Uh, and then um, usually we're trying to do something useful with this data, <laughs> some sort of social good. Um, if you want uh, to have a look, um, I will, uh, I'm going to run through in a minute a bunch of demos, if I have time, um, uh, that are available on a website we've put together. Most of the students I'm working with um, have, uh, or many of the students I'm working with, have sort of set up demos over time demonstrating their um, uh, the systems they built um, as part of their thesis. That's not the aim of the thesis to build a system, but it's usually nice to, to show it along the way. Um, and so uh, you can have a look at these, uh, these um, examples after the talk for sure. Um, really, uh, I've the, the directions that I want to supervise students in, and I don't have specific projects uh, except for maybe two that I want to mention. Um, in general, deep learning with text, some uh, I'm, I'm interested in extending this work in detecting false claims, uh, so ideas around that, or um, generating text for um, uh, for explainable AI. So in most cases, explainable AI is which features were useful for the prediction. In our case, it's we generate text to explain why a prediction was made. Um, deep learning with images, there's a lot of work I want to extend in terms of um, doing a better user study in visual question answering. So it's asking questions about images and there's ongoing work in deep fake detection. Uh, if people are really interested in that, um, then uh, deep learning with genomic data. Um, protein embeddings uh, is something we've been looking at for uh, drug prediction, but I'm actually pretty, particularly interested in supervising a project at the moment on generating text to describe protein. So there we would take all of uh, descriptions, uh, protein sequences um, that are available and descriptions that are available on. Wikipedia and elsewhere and try and train a system to explain the protein, the language of the proteins in human language. Uh, so in English, you know, or another natural language. Um, and then uh, I'm working with colleagues on uh, monitoring rail systems. So if any students want to um, uh, get involved in projects there, um, we use commuter rails to try and understand the, the, the uh, status of the rail track. Um, uh, so the trains are running over the railway lines and the accelerometer accelerometer data from the trains is being collected to try and assess the quality of the rail at different parts and whether or not there's issues like um, the rail needs to be fixed or ground or something like that. Okay, uh, so that's about all I had in terms of slides because I wanted to spend some time just showing you some quickly some demos if I have time. Um, so let's pop over to this demo site. Um, there you'll see a bunch of demos. There's actually uh, a, a number of older demos that I'm still in the process of um, getting to run all at the same time on my machine. Uh, but um, you can certainly have a play looking through some of them. Uh, one of the, there are demos to do with deep fakes. Um, there are demos on a data integration system we built, uh, outdoor uh, geolocation systems, explanation systems, social sense and pipeline uh, that I mentioned, um, and then a couple of uh, demos to do with um, uh, detecting different types of um, uh, news or, uh, or detecting malware. Um, Given the limited amount of time, I think I'm going to jump into this one if it's running. Outdoor geolocation. This is uh, being built by our student Luca Loria, which is uh, who has done an amazing job at um, making a fun demo. What um, 
what this demo does is it, it divides the planet up into 70 odd regions um, and he has uh, downloaded uh, over a million images off of Flickr uh, and trained a system for uh, a hierarchical model for trying, I don't know what that is, might just move on to that, that's a weird image, um, uh, a hierarchical model for attempting to classify uh, or identify the location from which a, a, an image has been taken. Uh, so we have a particular image of a street here. You can see where the we've got two models that are running, uh, two different hierarchical models, um, uh, and what aspects of the uh, image that they're looking at, in this case the building, um, and maybe also the people there. And it's attempting to um, assign probabilities to different regions of where that image might have been taken. So it was, it was sort of thought it was more uh, central Mediterranean, but it's actually the original image is uh, from like Greece or Turkey there. Um, so uh, you can see it's assigned 4.4% uh, confidence to the actual true location. We can try another image. Uh, again, pretty hard for a human to, to determine uh, where that image was taken. Uh, you might be able, if you, if you get um, a bit practiced at it, you might be able to identify different tree species or, or the like. Uh, obviously, snow is only uh, in certain, uh, it's, is that snow? Yeah, it should be snow. Um, It'd be weird if snow was occurring in the south of the United States. Um, but you can see, again, the model. Uh, in this case, it seemed to predict more that it was over towards um, New York area, but that's not quite right. Try one more image, then we move on to another demo. Um, so this is uh, an image from the mountain somewhere, and... Uh, Looks like the true location of this image was somewhere in the Himalayas uh, and the model uh, associated it with the, the, a region, India and um, uh, um, Central Asia. Um, the, the different region sizes that have been uh, produced by this model have to do with the number of images that we had available. Uh, so more or less uh, approximately the same number of images have been signed. So some regions are larger and some regions like the area around London is quite detailed. OK, that's one example of an application that one student built. Uh, another application that's kind of fun to have a look at is this textual explanations for deep fakes. I mean, all of them are fun. Uh, all of the uh, the projects are exciting, so I encourage you to have a look later. Um, this is a, a project where we're looking at different frames from deep fake videos. You can see the left frame is the original video sequence, and the right frame is the one that's been modified by the deep fake generation. It hasn't done a particularly good job job on this. You can see that there's some issues with the with the uh, glasses uh, in the way that the face has been modified. Um, there's a video there explaining how this tool works, but I'm going to skip straight through and we can have a look at two frames. Uh, we can zoom in if we want to, and we can see that in this particular image, this uh, the, the deep fake generation did a terrible job of, um, of producing, um, of filling in the face. Uh, so the face in this case is quite smudged, I would say. So this tool is all about collecting um, textual descriptions along with annotation, with uh, spatial annotations of um, uh, modified frames, letting users decide which one uh, they believe has been modified. In this case, I'm pretty sure that moustache is not the real one, um, just because it looks kind of strange, although the rest of the, the face looks quite good. So... I'm just going to circle that and say moustache. Uh, somebody can tell me how to spell moustache, but it um, uh, doesn't look quite right. Okay, let's see if we can. Here's a bit of a better 
frame, a bit harder to tell which one has been modified. Um, in this case, I think uh, if I had a bit more time, I'd be asking for feedback from uh, the audience on who thinks the uh, which frame has been modified. I actually uh, know this um, uh, particular video, so it's a bit easier for me to tell. Um, but in fact, uh, I know that this is the modified frame, even though the, the resolution is very high and very uh, almost looks more reasonable here than on the on the right frame. OK, so that's another example of a system we've been um, where students have been building. Uh, uh, there's another deep fake uh, detection system um, that looks I'm going to flip through this. It's taking a bit of time. It shows different different problems that we see in deep fakes like flickering, uh, smudging, unusual characteristics and um, uh, allows uh, for annotation of that. Uh, a system that's I'm very excited about, um, as I said, excited about all of these systems, um, now is a uh, an explanation system uh, that generates text. This is being built by Vittorio Tori. And it really wouldn't matter which of these systems I show you, they're all uh, fascinating and interesting in their own right. Um, in this case, uh, we're trying to help a user. You can imagine a, um, a patient perhaps who's been, um, who's received a, a, or a, a medical professional possibly who's uh, making use of a system um, that's uh, performing classification. In this case, uh, we've got different, different uh, data sets, although they're not loading at the moment. Um, this this is a, um, a a cardiovascular disease data set, but it, we could load another um, a classification problem. We have different classifiers here. This on the left is the set of features. On the right is the prediction for this instance. Uh, on the left here, we see the um, uh, the importance of the different features for that particular prediction. Um, if we hover over any of the f in input features, uh, we can see uh, the distribution of the values for that um, feature from the data set, as well as um, uh, what we call a ceteris paribus plot, which is a plot of how does the prediction change as that value of that feature is modified, uh, keeping everything else constant. So you can see this is all information that's very useful for a practitioner trying to understand what's going on, um, why a prediction, what, why a particular prediction was made. Not so useful for a patient or for a doctor who doesn't really care about machine learning. Uh, also, we're showing uh, counterfactual examples. So these are examples uh, that are close in the space to the instance, but where the predicted value has changed. So instead of predicting cardiovascular disease, somebody uh, who is about the same age but female and has a normal level of cholesterol uh, would have been predicted as not having cardiovascular disease. So given all of this information, this tool is actually not about providing that information. It's about providing explanations textual explanations. The first motivation for the prediction of cardiovascular disease is the well above the level 130s. So you can see the textual description is, um, let's look at the second one. The second one looks a bit better. The first element which influenced the prediction of cardiovascular disease is the value of systolic blood pressure, 130. The second important element is the value of BMI, which is one standard deviation above the mean. And also the fact that the patient is not a smoker is relevant. The BMI if the BMI was 32 and the age was 49, the opposite would have been predicted. So this piece of text, which we're still working on improving, is actually generated by a deep learning system uh, attempting to explain um, the, um, this particular prediction. And moreover, we even have a system, a uh, question answering system that, that runs with this as well. OK, I think I'm out of time, unfortunately, but I would, I would love to show you some of the metadata integration tools, social sensing pipeline, which is fun, uh, malware detection. I could click on it really quickly. So this is a demo that looks at the, the uh, 
uh, decompiled um, uh, source code uh, and tries to annotate the source code, um, allowing an analyst to determine whether or not the classification of a particular uh, Android toolkit um, is uh, as malicious or not was correct. Um, I uh, am aware of uh, not wanting to infringe on other people's time, so I might leave it there. Um, pop back to uh, allow. Oh, thank you, Professor. So that was uh, really Stefano's time. I'm taking Stefano's time. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Ciao, Mark. Ciao. All right. I'll leave you all. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, and a pleasure, and thank you, Alessandro, for organizing. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, before you go, could you please share with us the slides of your presentation? Because uh, I guess there were many students who couldn't be here because of lessons or or other, I don't know, commitments they had, and so we can share the slides on our I'll, I'll chat. pop them in the chat now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. So, welcome, Professor Micheli. Um, okay. Whenever you want, you can uh, start your presentation. Fine, thank you. So let me see if I can. How do I share content? I've never done it on uh, on uh, uh, Teams, uh, believe it or not, because I've used other systems. Are you you are seeing the the screen now, right? Yeah, I'm seeing the presentation. Okay, good. Okay, so well, uh, um, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to give this presentation, which actually will be given not only by me, but by three plus two plus one uh, students, uh, actually not students, uh, um, uh, PhDs and postdocs. Uh, it's about uh, the, the, all the proposals that we have uh, been thinking in the context of the so-called JECO project. So JECO stands for genomic computing. Uh, whenever I give a presentation in genomics, I start with something very general because uh, uh, most of the people who are attending don't have any background in genomics. It's just to attract you. Uh, the first uh, picture we show is, the, is, the, is uh, an important one. It shows the cost of uh, sequencing the, gen the, gen the human genome, which is actually dropping at some specific point of time thanks to what is called the next generation sequencing technology, which has been able to reduce uh, uh, the cost of a full genome to something of the order of uh, $1,000. And uh, I mean, now it's a little bit flattening the kind of, uh, of uh, um, reduction of cost, but still $1,000 is much less than the original uh, uh, human genome project, which was the uh, order of millions of dollars and involved in several uh, organizations. The human genome, in terms, contains exactly the same amount of information of the Encyclo uh, Britannic Encyclopedia, which I have here represented in Chinese because uh, I don't understand Chinese. So similarly, it is very hard to understand the human genome. It has a lot and lot of uh, information. Actually, I learned that uh, it doesn't make sense to think of it as a, a, a sequence of letters but more as a living creature, which has a lot of uh, uh, additional uh, signals which is sending to us. And uh, the interesting aspect about it is that it is uh, a code. And similarly to Alan Turing, uh, which we all know, uh, uh, who has been able to decipher the Enigma code, we are challenging to decipher a much more complex code and as a computer scientist, uh, we have to do it uh, uh, correctly, quickly, fast, uh, uh, and so on. There is, there is uh, a lot of uh, interesting prob problems behind. Uh, my uh, interest started a bit earlier, but was uh, boosted by the fact that I got uh, this ERC advanced grant, grant, which just finished, as a matter of fact. And uh, uh, you may see that uh, uh, well, first of all, this grant was 2.5 million euro. So 2.5 million euro is a lot of money and allows me to get, uh, let's say, uh, students, uh, uh, interested people, collaboration and so on. Additionally, uh, uh, the idea behind the grant was uh, on uh, uh, doing everything data driven, but with a radical change in uh, data management abstraction. We wanted them to become broader and simpler at the same time. 
So we we add a lot of results in genomic. Uh, uh, this is really human human uh, genomics. Uh, we did the data models, data integration, data extraction, and so on. We had results. Uh, we had uh, some ongoing work, uh, uh, um, and so on. But at some point, uh, COVID-19 came in, and here you see what happens to the to the world of research after COVID-19 came in. This is just a, a, a publication about virology, and it showed that essentially everything we said to do with uh, HIV influenza was dominated right away by SARS-CoV-2. Uh, in general, there is a database uh, which is called CORE19, which is over 500,000 scholarly ar articles, which are actually annotated. So it's uh, uh, and there are huge resources in terms of uh, uh, information which is available and uh, uh, about uh, research which has been done since uh, COVID-19 pandemic's uh, outbreak. Uh, our focus has changed then from the multiomics uh, uh, for the human gen genomics to the RNA sequences for the viral genomics. And to some extent, we were also in a, in a nice uh, in, in situation because the human genome is uh, three for, uh, uh, multiplied by 10 to the ninth, that, uh, that is to say order of billions DNA nucleotides. The viral genome is much smaller. It is a uh, 30K basis of RNA nucleotides. So it is like, uh, going to a much lower scale that for us it's uh, like uh, playing with something very very easy from the computational point of view if we think to the uh, to the single uh, sequence then of course we were able to to have uh, all the four million uh, uh, viral sequences which, which uh, uh, exist in the world at least in terms of the uh, uh, amino acid changes which is the most important information so we we collected on our server at, at Politecnico di Milano all, this, all the sequences of uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2. What we did uh, is uh, essentially to take uh, 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 one goal, that is producing data-driven abstraction and systems, one systematic approach, which means uh, first modeling, uh, then integrating and building, and integrating and building really means uh, build data integration pipeline, normalize, semantic annotation, uh, build the repositories to be contained, to be consolidated and maintained, and then search, build, uh, uh, understand the needs of end user and produce search interfaces of repositories. And I would also add to this analyze. We have a, a huge number of, uh, of data analysis tools. But we do it for two domains. We had started from human genomics, which is what happened before 20, uh, March 2020. And then we have to move to viral, the viral sequences, which is what happened after March 2020. So the, the, the rest of the presentation is going to be divided into parts. We have one part, which is given by Anna, who will talk about viral genomics. Then one part, which is given by Pietro, which will talk about uh, human genomics. And then we'll come back uh, to talk about miscellaneous other topics for thesis. And with this, uh, I think uh, we, we, we decided that the best way to go is to uh, each one uh, uh, present his own uh, uh, his, own, his own view. So if I, okay, so I, I yeah. let uh, Anna to go on with that part. Yeah, um, hello everyone. Thank you, Stefano, for the introduction. Um, so a very brief uh, crash course on viral genomics, specifically on RNA viruses, which are the kind of uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, viruses are these pathogens that attack uh, the cells uh, of the host the, in the receptors. They are injected into the cells uh, and thanks to the either DNA or RNA fragments, uh, they uh, exploit the replication mechanism of the cells uh, to replicate and then to exit the cells and uh, attack other cells. Um, specifically, SARS-CoV-2 is an RNA virus, so it's just uh, one strand, not a double strand uh, like uh, DNA, and uh, it's made of four kinds of uh, nucleotide bases, uh, um, adenine, cytosine, guanine, and uracil in place of timine. And uh, in uh, groups of three bases, they encode four proteins. So RNA viruses are 
quite common. Uh, uh, maybe nobody thought about it, but uh, when you heard in the news about SARS, MERS, dengue, Ebola, hepatitis, uh, uh, polio, measles, they were all RNA viruses. And if we give a closer look to the structure of the SARS-CoV-2, as Professor Cherry said, uh, we have a pretty small uh, genomic segment, which is 30 uh, kilobases. Um, and uh, these bases are direct, uh, direct the synthesis of proteins. Um, if you compare it with uh, human genomes, you can think that uh, we have 4 plus 16, so 20 uh, proteins, so genes in the viral genome, and we have 20,000 genes in the human genome. So the scales are quite different. And uh, here you see in the red are structural proteins, uh, where you see also the S, which is a spike that you may uh, have heard of, and then many non-structural proteins within these two open reading frames. Um, so one thing that is very important when you look at the viral sequence is uh, the mutations that are present on this sequence, because of course mutation change the behavior of the virus, it may mm, make it uh, more uh, uh, dangerous, it may, be, it may spread uh, uh, more quickly, it may change many uh, aspects that relate also to treatment and vaccines. So the first level we look at is the level of uh, mutations at the, in the nucleotides. So uh, the way you indicate this is by giving a number, which is a position on the genome, and then the reference nucleotide, which should have been A, and the one instead, which was substituting the reference one. And mutations may be a very, of many kinds, silent, if they don't change the protein that is created uh, by the triplet of nucleotides. Um, you can think that there are um, 64, so 4 to the third, to the power of, third, of 3, uh, 64 different triplets, but they only encode for 20 amino acids. So there are many uh, of these triplets that encode for the same protein. In this case, AAG and AAA, uh, all um, encode for the lysine. Then you also may have nonsense mutations when they basically tell the, um, the translation uh, process to stop the protein. Um, and this is very disruptive because, of course, the, the protein will be much shorter than expected. Or missense. So in this case, uh, uh, given to these two mutations, uh, the protein that is produced is uh, different from the expected one. Then you also uh, analyze uh, uh, mutations on the amino acid level, which is what we, we just saw. And for example, the famous spike D614G, uh, which was uh, um, discussed a lot at the beginning of uh, 2020 because it was supposed to give uh, uh, an advantage to, uh, to the virus in terms of spreading, uh, this was uh, um, actually encoded by uh, this mutation at the nucleotide level. And amino acid changes are very interesting because uh, you can actually consider them based on the position that they occupy in the protein, uh, which of course uh, may have effects on their binding uh, in, uh, with, the, uh, with the, the cells of the host. And they're also interesting because the co particular co-occurrence of these changes may have uh, um, additional effects. And uh, another interesting thing is that uh, uh, when, they, when uh, changes co-occur, where, where they combine uh, in uh, many different uh, uh, mutations, they form what, they, what we call variants. You've all heard about alpha and delta variants, uh, and of how they actually uh, started uh, quite silently in their countries, but then uh, became wi uh, widespread around the world. And you can imagine that they can be represented as these cl uh, colored clusters along a phylogenetic tree, which represents all the uh, different mutations that accumulate along uh, the, the long sequence of the virus and uh, um, 
form clusters of, uh, of new different uh, uh, subkinds of SARS-CoV-2. And this is, for example, the set of changes uh, that uh, uh, characterize the alpha variant. These are present in the 75% of the sequences of this variant. Um, and both uh, two um, single uh, mutations and two variants, uh, we can connect uh, uh, different effects. These effects uh, may have to do with the epidemiology of the virus, for example, the viral transmission, how infectious is the virus, uh, the, ra the rate of the fatality of the disease, the disease severity, but also to effects uh, that are at a smaller uh, scale on the dynamics of the protein of the virus, such as the stability, flexibility, and the inter interactions between the proteins. And maybe, um, maybe the most interesting effects are those that have to do with the immunology, meaning the sensit sensitivity to uh, treatments such as uh, the convalescent serum, so the serum of uh, patients that have had COVID-19 and uh, um, are um, recovered from the disease, sensitivity to the monoclonal antibodies, or the binding affinity to the host receptor. Here in this image, we see exactly this. Uh, this is a spike, which is a protein that forms uh, this crown uh, around the, the virus. The spike has a, uh, here a pink part, which is called receptor binding domain, that is made for attaching precisely to the host receptor of the cell, um, for example, of humans. Uh, so what happens if uh, the, uh, the virus uh, has a mutation exactly in this part? Will it be able to attach to the, um, to the host receptor anyways, or it will attach uh, more easily? Uh, or what will happen in general to all the treatments that use uh, this mechanism? So um, here I come to four possible proposals uh, of thesis. Uh, of course, we're open to, to other ideas and changes, but uh, let me uh, go for this first. The first has to do with the detection of uh, co-occurring mutations. By co-occurrence, we mean that we have a set of sequences and we want to uh, check all the cases where, for example, mutation A and B occur on the same sequence. Um, the co-occurrence sequence is used, for example, for defining lineages. Uh, so a lineage is formed when one or a set of mutations occur increasingly in a fixed population. For example, the delta lineage was defined by, at the beginning by two quite dangerous co-occurring variants. And uh, we would like to design statistical tests that uh, for, um, for a start are appropriate for very large data sets because as of now we have more than 4 million sequencing sequences uh, and uh, more than 100 million mutations uh, distributed along these sequences. <coughs> We would like to verify the significance of particular pairs of co-occurring mutations. Uh, one, one other thing that is very interesting is to then link the result to external knowledge on mutation effects, as I explained before, that could be on epidemiology and immunology aspects. And I leave here a couple of papers that are interesting uh, if you would like to pursue these uh, aspects. Uh, second, we have uh, um, quite different project. This is uh, about uh, knowledge connected to the virus. So in this uh, image, you see that we are modeling uh, all the information that uh, should be known about SARS-CoV-2, all the variants uh, that are uh, available and ca characterized by different organizations, such as the World, uh, World Health Organization, uh, the Public Health England, and so on and so forth their effects, which may be uh, both of variants or of single or uh, just uh, small sets of amino acid changes. These are in specific positions. They relate to a particular structure of the virus, and they also have related uh, shapes of the protein. 
what we would like to do is uh, to um, uh, consider particularly interesting this effects part and to mine literature to understand if there are um, if there is a way to automatically extract effects uh, of mutations. So this is a very complex area because, of course, as Professor Cherry said, uh, there is a data set of more than 500,000 uh, papers, uh, research papers published on this matter. So it is a huge data set and uh, not so well curated yet. There are some labeling efforts going on, but uh, there is still a lot of space for doing research uh, in this area. So um, let us know if you're interested in this challenging project. Then we have uh, um, some ideas for uh, preparing an early warning system for data-driven variance detection. So here is a very preliminary study that we did uh, where basically we analyzed a series of single amino acids. We tried to see if they were moving um, all in the same way um, in agreement, let's say, if they were clustering in, in a particular way, and we were able to identify the uh, growth of the most famous variants uh, identified by the World Health Organization so far. You can see them named here alpha, beta, uh, kappa, delta, and so on and so forth. And we were able to recognize them at a pretty early stage in uh, um, during their growth. So we would like to extend this experiment for performing time series analysis to identify potential patterns of common growth of multiple mutations and build a predictive method usable for putting in place an alerting system. Here again, some useful readings. And finally, uh, I'm presenting the idea for a variant hunter. Uh, here we have a, an example, you probably don't see it well, but the idea here was to identify mutations that uh, uh, differentiate the kappa and the delta variants. Kappa and delta both uh, um, were born in India, and uh, pretty soon delta uh, got widespread, while kappa remained uh, uh, not, so, not so spread. Here, the idea is that uh, uh, there were probably um, a set of, here we report, uh, six mutations that kind of gave an advantage to the delta one. So the idea here is to uh, perform uh, um, small analysis, uh, potentially with an automatic approach, so uh, implementing bioinformatics tool and pipelines can, that can do this, to uh, try and understand if uh, um, from sequence data we can um, identify potentially new variants. So um, the idea is that uh, potentially new variants are also uh, possibly dangerous. So of course, uh, uh, there is uh, much interest from the community of variant hunters uh, for this problem. And we would like to support them with our bioinformatic experience and computation experience. OK, so I think uh, this is it. Uh, this is just an overview of the systems that we have already in place, just to give you um, the idea that there is a lot of uh, work that has been done. And all the things that we are proposing are going to build uh, to be built on top of this. We have uh, three or four systems already in production. Uh, Viruclass is being prepared. Cov2K is uh, um, what will contain the, the information extracted from literature about knowledge and effects on variants. And uh, I may skip uh, the description of all these tools because if you are interested, we, we can send the slides and we will uh, explain this in detail. Here are some relevant publications for you from the group, and I may pass the word uh, to Pietro. For Hi, all. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. So let me share.
Ok. Okay, so as anticipated by Professor Cherry, uh, we talk about uh, the work our uh, group did uh, on uh, human genomics, in particular during uh, the period of um, the ERC grant, but we are also continuing. Um, as we anticipated, in the last 10, 15 years, there has been a, a huge revolution thanks to the next generation sequencing that allowed to produce a lot of experiment. Um, so, this radically changed uh, bioinformatics in general and computational biology. So far, we can, uh, 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 today we can differentiate computational biology in uh, three areas. The first area is a primary analysis, so when you analyze what comes out from the sequ this, uh, sequencer. The secondary analysis, where you take one single experiment and extract information from this experiment. So, for example, you do some sequencing and you try to understand what are the mutations in this experiment. And the tertiary analysis where you take uh, many heterogeneous uh, information, many heterogeneous signals from different uh, data set and you try to combine, to integrate all this information to answer complex biological information, complex biological question. So what you usually see when you use a genome browser, which is a common tool to visualize uh, experiment on the human genome is a, a series of different uh, information where we can have genes with associated expression activity, uh, biochemical uh, modification of the DNA, or some binding between proteins and the DNA, as well as information about the 3D conformation of uh, the DNA. We have uh, develop tool to help biologists to answer uh, both biological question and clinical question. So biological questions such as why, uh, what happens when uh, a mutation appears, for example, in proximity of a junction of a loop, and clinical question which, which tend usually to stratify the patient. So for example, understand if there is some a genomic feature that can differentiate patient that will respond or will be uh, refactory to a particular treatment. Uh, in general, uh, both if you are trying to uh, answer a biological or a clinical question, the tertiary data analysis has the shape of uh, a usual data science pipeline, data science analysis. So you start with the data structure, you take your data, you organize your data, you do some integration if necessary, some cleaning. Then you start with some data exploration, typically uh, visual exploration, where you plot your data, you try to get uh, some hypotheses from the data, and you try maybe to refine also the previous step of uh, cleaning and organizing the data. Then you do the actual analysis, where you try to uh, answer to your question using classic all the method that we have about statistics, machine learning, deep learning, data mining, and so on. Uh, finally, you plot the result. Again, the visualization is very important. And according to the visualization, you can either refine your analysis or restart and try to find uh, novel hypothesis, novel, uh, novel question. Uh, from the point of view of the system, we have developed a, a many system uh, to do so. <coughs> In particular, we have GenoSurf, which is a repository of genomic data. And then we have a complex uh, query system that works uh, on uh, Spark. So it's uh, designed to work with big data with uh, a specific uh, query system, query query language that we designed and implemented that can solve and uh, retrieve data from a large collection of genomic data. And this data then can be analyzed using uh, the machine learning uh, or deep learning technique that we have seen. Uh, so now I'm going to show you what we are working now, working on now. 
and uh, what are the possible uh, thesis proposal, the possible collaboration that we can have with you. So first of all, as we said, thanks to the large availability of data, uh, applying data science uh, is becoming necessary for a large number of biologists, uh, inf bioinformatician and clinician. However, usually these scientists do not have a strong computational background. They still have data, they have uh, the important question, but they lack somehow the skills to design and to execute a data-driven pipeline, data-driven solution to find the answer to their question. For this reason, we start implementing GECOAGENT, which combine a natural language interface and a multimodal interface, where the user, so a biologist or clinician, interacting with a conversational agent, describe what he wants to do with the data, and uh, assisted by the interface with some support panel and uh, visualization of uh, partial result, uh, partial state of the, of the execution, can mm, design a full computational pipeline and get the result from extracting data up to uh, visualizing the, the result. <coughs> the conversational agent also sometimes, uh, sometimes can interact by giving some advice such that the user, even if is uh, not so skilled in data science, can still uh, compute a meaningful pipeline. What comes next? Next, we are evolving JECO agent in order to solve one of the main problems. The main problem is that JECO agent is still procedural and, and imperative somehow. So uh, the scientist have to describe step by step his pipeline. For sure, is assisted by is she is assisted by the conversational agent, which explain, uh, which helps through the process, but still uh, the user needs some knowledge about the pipeline. What we would like to have is a more declarative interaction with the system, where the user poses his question with a, uh, in a natural language. So for example, what mutation differentiates between patients that are sensitive or resistant to drugs? uploads this data, and the system automatically builds a pipeline that, uh, starting from the intent of the user, so what the user wants to achieve, and the characteristic of the data, uh, try to provide an answer to, to the question. And finally, the system must provide an explanation to the user, typically natural language or visualization, to explain what result uh, has been obtained and uh, how the result could be, uh, could be interpreted. <coughs> we had an initial uh, prototype, which is the S-Bot. And it's a framework where after you have, have uploaded your data and uh, express a, a, a question in natural language, you get some result. You still have a conversational agent that explain you a bit of the result, and you can play with some um, uh, parameters to change your result, to adjust your result. How this system works, it starts from the research question and the data set provided by the user. And first perform a translation of the research question to an intermediate representation of an analysis workflow. So a series of operations that would represent a workflow as intended, as translated by what the user uh, wants to achieve. Then there is a, a, a optimization, let's say, where the workflow is augmented, is uh, enriched by looking uh, to uh, either a knowledge base where we have, where we set, where we store uh, common analysis and the characteristic of the data set. So the system automatically understands if, for example, it's necessary to pre-process the data in some way because you have uh, missing data, categorical data, outlier, if some uh, clustering emitter are better than other, and so on. Finally, the system <coughs> provides uh, the result and uh, can accept some user feedback some user request uh, in order to optimize the results. So for example, 
suppose we are doing a clustering, the user uh, says, okay, but from the cluster, from the visualization, I think there are too few clusters, I would like to have more cluster. The system can uh, repair the pipeline in order to allow uh, the, the pipeline to find more clusters. So the level of uh, uh, collaboration that we can have at this, uh, uh, on this system are many. So we can have a collaboration on this uh, error. So on, the, on this translation from the research question to our flow. And this we can use, uh, we are now using a simple uh, LSTM transla translation. We can use much more uh, complicated step, much complicated method and, and uh, approaches. <coughs> uh, a step on this translation where we move from the initial pipeline to a more uh, powerful, more optimized pipeline using maybe uh, algorithms, both uh, the statistic, um, descriptive statistics in the data set and uh, auto machine learning tool to organize the pipeline. And finally, on the explanation part. So at the end, the software must be able to explain the result to the user, possibly in natural language, and, uh, and providing not only the result as they are, but also some explanation on uh, what the result means. A second project, uh, this actually is a uh, many project, uh, is a family project, regards uh, drug discovery and precision personalized medicine. So drug, uh, sorry, drug repurposing. Drug repurposing is the task of uh, finding a drug which is already approved, uh, which, are, which is already in use, and identify a novel usage for the drug. This has a, a uh, large benefit, first of all, because it reduces a lot the cost of drug uh, production, drug design, and also speed up the drug design. Uh, indeed, uh, most of the drugs uh, fail somehow in the process of uh, validation. If you start from a drug that has already been validated, your chance of failure are much less. The second uh, part regards the personalized medicine. And here the task is to, uh, so the problem is that usually when you have patients, each patient is different. So when you administrate to a patient a therapy, you usually notice that a group of patients take the benefit of the therapy, some patients have no benefit, and some other has only the adverse effect of uh, the, the therapy. It is because patients are very different are usually different at the level of uh, uh, genomics and genetics. Personalized medicine, before deciding which therapy uh, is uh, um, put, uh, ideally perform some analysis on the patient, on the genomics of the patient, and on the biomarker, on the uh, genomic genetic feature of the patient, decide which therapy to administer to each subgroup of the patient such that each patient benefit of uh, the most that uh, she or he can get from the, the, the treatment, um, maybe uh, avoiding also the adverse effects. We did many work on this, particular on drug repurposing. Uh, our work are generally based on uh, integration of main information about drugs, and we did uh, uh, works for, uh, these are all computational works in, in the end, and we did work for identification of novel uh, indication for a drug, so novel therapeutic indication, prediction of novel target for the drugs, combination of drugs, uh, finding anti-cancer and uh, anti-metastasis drugs, and also now we, we are doing work where we try to associate the feature of uh, some individual with uh, the outcome of a treatment. The goal here, uh, so, when, so what we do usually is, for example, we predict that this drug is associated with a novel indication. 
but we have no clue why the system predicted such uh, novel association. What would be interesting is to have a system that a meter that also tells you, okay, I uh, predicted this novel indication for this, this, and that. Uh, so what we are searching here is to develop some more explainable uh, method for approaching drug repurposing and patient stratification, which means um, uh, precision medicine, precision therapy. Uh, last uh, project we are following now, uh, that I'm presenting you, is uh, about uh, the uh, COVID disease. So we learn, unfortunately, that uh, the COVID uh, can have uh, several outcomes once uh, uh, people get infected. So there are people that have no symptoms at all, and there are people that get very bad, uh, very bad symptoms. This depends for sure on some demographic uh, variables, such as the age, the sex, the smoking habits, and if you have other diseases. But there are also some parts which depends on genetic feature of the person, of the patient. Uh, this work is in collaboration with the University of Siena and the Hospital of Siena, where they collected the genetic features, so the uh, sequence of the whole DNA, of uh, approximately 3,000 patients, and they are still collecting data. And they associate each patient with the severity of the symptom. So if the patient had no symptoms at all or uh, needed to be uh, uh, hospitalized, and also some more uh, specific uh, feature, for example, which organs were involved and so on. Our, our goal is to find uh, groups of genes that are correlated with the disease, with the uh, possibility to have uh, mild or severe uh, um, symptoms of the disease. So the idea we have uh, now is using association rule, so mine association rule, and get that genes are, uh, some genes are associated with my symptoms, some genes are associated with, for example, the involvement of a particular uh, organ. The problem is that uh, the human genome has 20,000 genes, we still have only 3,000 patients, uh, so this does not actually fit with classical uh, association rule mining methods because we have a very large space, which is also sparse because uh, the mutated genes per person are usually few and only few sample. So the goal would be to design a set of algorithms, some methods, to uh, mine association rule in this type of situation, where you have uh, where you have much more feature than sample. First of all, to solve this specific problem, because we have uh, access to this very precious data set, but also as a general method to apply in general to biological problem, where uh, we understood, we as a scientific community understood that usually it's not a single gene that uh, is involved with a disease, with uh, a phenotype, with uh, some observable characteristic of uh, the human, but it's a set of genes. Um, okay, this was the project I presented. Some, some uh, of our publication, you will have the slides, so you can look at them more carefully. And I leave the stage to Professor Cherry for the last topic. So, thank you. Okay, so I'm going to share. I'm not sure if you see my, my screen now. Let's see, first uh, enough. Uh, okay, hopefully so. Do you see my screen now? Yes? Yes, we can. Okay, so I conclude. Uh, also, we have a request uh, from Francesco. We would like to have five minutes to talk to the students as well. So I conclude with a few other topics which have uh, 
uh, less to do with, uh, let's say, conventional uh, quote-unquote genomics. Uh, the, the two topics have uh, are, uh, the first one is the sound of genome. It's a very wild uh, and uh, exploratory idea, but it could be, uh, let's say, uh, in, 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 to, in, um, interesting uh, for for some of you which are more in, interested in in uh, uh, let's say sound music and so on and then we have also some work which has nothing to do with genomics it is more on uh, knowledge management uh, using uh, 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 so let me start uh, from uh, the sound of genome well, if, if I click here, and I would like to do it, but maybe it's, uh, I'm not sure what will happen, so I invite you to do it. You, you essentially see that uh, the stars, uh, well, I can try, let's see what happens, and then maybe you will give up. Uh, there is a, a, a strange noise that uh, each uh, star makes in the universe. And uh, based on the noise that uh, the star is making on the universe, you can understand the feature of the star. For instance, whether it is a nova, supernova, and so on, how, how big it is, and so on. So I am uh, excited by the idea of understanding something about the genome, which is of this uh, very generic nature, the, the, the sound of the genome. Huh? You see that, for instance, here you understand the, the, the sound. And a few other features, and this has to do with course, understanding the, the, the signal and trying to understand the aspects. Let me quit here, and I go back to the presentation. Well, the present essentially, as I said, I am fan of music. I am about to go for to a concert. Uh, I realize that uh, the kind of, of signal that is shown on on the genome is is somehow has some similarities with the signal that we are used to to read the one which which do some some music eh? uh, and this is the brandenburg concert but uh, we could actually probably the sound of the genome is much less nice than the brandenburg concert it's more like uh, the sound of the stars that we are talking about also the genome is organized into into areas which uh, are uh, uh, let's say correspond to the uh, sections of uh, 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 let's say musical uh, uh, piece. So essentially, the chromosome or even the chromosome arm is like, a, a, let's say, a, a movement, and then inside the movement we have, uh, and, and in particular, there are areas of the genome which are where the, the sound is very much consistent, which correspond to the topological or architecture of the genome in, into 3D, three-dimensional aspect. So pretty much in the same in the same way as uh, the, the the music shows the structure. So here we are looking for uh, uh, students who like uh, uh, in, in multidisciplinary work where we essentially will involve uh, sound experts. And here we, uh, we have uh, recruited, uh, well, recruited, I mean, uh, we are ha happy to have uh, as a, as a co-organizer of this research, uh, Augusto Sarti, who is the director of the Image and Sound Processing Lab. Then we have the biologist, uh, from uh, UNIL uh, and then three of us. And what we need are data scientists with passion of sound and music. Okay, the second uh, thing that I wanted to mention, to, 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 to cite to you is uh, the fact that we do have uh, uh, also uh, financial applications. And in particular, I have a, a, a student which is working with me, which is uh, which uh, is an executive student from the Bank of Italy. And uh, what we are doing with these students uh, is to try to um, represent uh, knowledge graphs, but also to compute knowledge graphs uh, by means of uh, uh, um, uh, rules. And in particular, we can, uh, in, 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 uh, just to give you an, an, an example, in Banca d'Italia, they are interested in, in takeovers. A takeover of course when a company has uh, more than 50% uh, uh, of the share of another company. So in this particular case, A has a share of 7.7, uh, 7, so it directly uh, control uh, company 3. But if uh, A controls 1 and 1 has a control of uh, 0, 03 and in addition uh, A has, a, has his own share of 0, 03, 
then indirectly it controls also uh, company three. So you can imagine that this is a problem that uh, has uh, interesting uh, side effects in terms of uh, defining, uh, sorry, I've been too, too fast. Uh, uh, let's say, oh, these are, uh, I don't know how, I cannot probably stop it because this has been done by, by, by David. Anyway, you can imagine that we can write uh, uh, rules which essentially say that every every company control itself and then a, a company uh, who, con who uh, uh, controls Y, where Y owns a given share and we then can make the summation of, of all the shares uh, and then uh, uh, make sure that this summation is greater than 0.5, then X controls Y. And this is a particular kind of form of, of uh, uh, data log, which is called VADA log, which is more and more expressive than data log. It's invented by in, in Oxford and has been used in, uh, in uh, Banca d'Italia widely to, to understand the problems uh, with the, 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 the entire network of ownership of Italy which is uh, more than uh, uh, several millions of uh, nodes and arcs. I'm not remembering exact numbers, but the entire ownership uh, of Italy is, is, is uh, available. OK, so uh, in addition, what we are doing is to work over a reactive uh, uh, version of, uh, of a data log. That is to say, this uh, uh, data set, this knowledge graph, uh, uh, change uh, 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 by chunks. So you see uh, the, 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 the graph of today and then maybe you see the graph of uh, uh, next month. And what you would like to do is to find out a mechanism by means of which it is possible to derive what has changed. And if, for instance, we have a, a, an indication that a, a given road is fast when it is uh, it's uh, uh, let's say speed limit is greater than 90. Well, uh, we have uh, def defined uh, a mechanism of rewriting by f and, and some operators so that it is possible to essentially find uh, uh, based on the change of the roads, the new roads on, uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and the existing roads, if uh, uh, there are new fast road or some or some fast road has been deleted. And this is important. It's, it's a nice uh, intellectually challenging uh, research which has to do with uh, what, how to, to essentially derive uh, information which uh, changes uh, from a knowledge base which is uh, periodically updated. So uh, there are thesis proposals here uh, in uh, completing the implementation of the reasoner in Vadalog. And also, uh, we would like to bring uh, all this information to the knowledge base that we have seen already, uh, uh, COV2K, and then uh, possibly apply the same things uh, to uh, the same rules uh, to a, a, a context which, which is uh, periodically changing. Uh, what I wanted to show is that uh, actually uh, working on, COVID, on uh, data science offered me in particular, the possibility to work on a, on a, on a, on a lot of topics on COVID-19. We had a small participation on a nature paper. We had a participation on a work uh, that has been done with a, a colleague from Siena. We have been working on uh, uh, this uh, uh, analysis of data team and research on vaccines, uh, on, uh, on work on social economic differences and on uh, knowledge graphs. Why? Because uh, a data science expert essentially has this culture which is applicable to many domains. And in particular, if something like uh, COVID-19 happens, then you are immediately called to apply your knowledge to whatever problem you can, you can work on. This is the set of uh, the, the JECO team as of September 2021. Uh, these are the PhD graduates that I had. Many of them are still in genomics. They are even on the Broad Institute, which is the best possible place because it's Harvard and and uh, and, uh, and MIT combined in in, uh, in uh, Boston in Cambridge. Uh, Abdul Abdul Rahman went to TU Berlin and now he's actually working. Uh, as a matter of fact, this has to be updated in Amazon. Stefano went to NUS Singapore. Uh, Gaia went to Supercomputer Center in, in Barcelona. Luca is in Unilever, and then all the others are working in data science uh, uh, 
group, which by the way, an important message if I am giving to you is that you don't only have to take a master's degree, but you also have to take, make a PhD because it is becoming now very more and more appreciated to do a PhD after a master in data science. I mean, uh, then the graduates find uh, immediately uh, the best possible jobs. OK, uh, two more things. Uh, one has to do with the fact that uh, you will be soon receiving a, a call for a project which is called Data Life that we do together with uh, NYU uh, in, in New York University, the Center for Urban Science and uh, in Progress. And this has to do again uh, on uh, uh, seeing how COVID-19 has affected differentially New York uh, and uh, Milano. There will be a very tight uh, uh, selection because only two of you will be selected to be part of this group together with two designers and to go uh, to New York University. And you can read about uh, this uh, uh, project, uh, which is uh, actually has been running for the last two years as a follow up of a project that we had with Harvard University. So it's a very nice uh, project to have. And now if uh, Francesco is around, uh, he, he wanted five minutes of, uh, of time. I think you can give him five minutes of time. Francesco is a, is a PhD student of mine and uh, he is uh, working on a lot of things. He's, not, he's currently in, in the US. Uh, so uh, Francesco, if you, if you want, I think I can yeah, quit yeah. here. Okay, I think you are already somewhere in, 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 in the audience, right? Yeah, thanks. Do you, okay. can you hear me? Yes. Uh, all right. So Francesco, you changed your look since you, since the time you are in Indiana. <laughs> no, I just, I still have my long hair, you know. Okay, but they are somehow. Can you, can you see my slides? Yes, yes. Okay. So a, a final word to the students, in particular, if you are interested in working with us on the uh, COVID-19 problem with Siena, it is relatively urgent that we find someone. So drop us a note and we will put you in touch with uh, the people in Siena and we'll build a collaboration in, in that particular context. Everything, of course, is, uh, is urgent because uh, we want to solve a problem as fast as possible, but that one we are looking really looking for, for people. Uh, Francesco. Okay, thank you, Stefano. Hi, everyone. Sorry for jumping in at the last minute. Uh, I'm Francesco Pieri, I'm a PhD student, I'm a third year PhD student in the Data Analytics and Decision Sciences program. I've been working mostly on understanding the spreading of misinformation and disinformation in online social networks. I use a computer science and network science uh, approach to this problem. So earlier this year we started uh, working on understanding the impact of uh, vaccine related misinformation on the vaccination campaigns. So we have two projects. So I'm working on one project in the US, which is called Covaxi, and the other in Italy, which is called Vaccine Italy. Uh, I'm going to put the, so we have public dashboards. Wait, sorry. Uh, okay. And um, the idea is to, you know, understand the interplay between uh, misinformation and, and anti-vax conversations on Twitter uh, and the actual vaccination campaign. So. We, uh, the idea is to understand the, in, the interplay between misinformation and vaccine hesitancy, which is a concept which covers a wide spectrum of intentions from delaying vaccination to an outright refusal to be vaccinated. And uh, we've been working on the US data so far. Uh, we leveraged over 55 million Twitter posts and 22 million survey responses from Facebook. And uh, so we, we found that in the US, uh, areas where there, are, there is more misinformation shared on Twitter are also associated with uh, less vaccine doses administered and higher levels of vaccine hesitancy rates. So uh, I'm going to show you the main, so this is the main result. The idea is that the states where people share more misinformation also tend to uh, administer le less vaccines. And here you see a cartogram where the area of each state is redrawn proportionally to the amount of misinformation and the color is mapped to the level of vaccine hesitancy. So you can see the Bible's belt, uh, which is very, let's say, famous for uh, being more conservative, right? And so there is a strong association 
between misinformation and vaccine hesitancy. And uh, the idea uh, uh, now, sorry, I'm going to skip the details. The idea now is to uh, extend this approach to Europe. So we are collecting tweets related to vaccines in multiple countries. And the uh, general uh, goal is to understand whether there is a correlation between misinformation and uh, vaccination campaigns. So uh, we geolocate users sharing tweets in these countries. Then uh, we want to build a classifier to identify automatically anti-vax conversations. And uh, yeah, so the, the general idea is to understand uh, these correlations. And there are multiple, uh, uh, there is a, a big number of possible directions of research directions. So if, you, if you're interested, please drop me an email. And uh, I'm also in the Telegram group, so yeah, feel free to write also on the Telegram group if you're interested. And uh, this is it. You are still a data I, science uh, member, right? Uh, association member, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, I, uh, sorry if I was too quick. I didn't want to steal you too much time. Well, uh, thanks. I think we have given you a lot of uh, possible uh, <laughs> topics for thesis, maybe more than the students that are, that are attending, I don't know. Anyway, I hope that you will uh, spread this around and uh, I think that has been recorded, right? So you can also show the recording. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, recorded. I think maybe many students didn't attend because uh, they were, I don't know, commuting or something like that. So we will show the slides and recording and uh, many more will see it probably. Okay, good. Uh, I need to go, but I think uh, you can get uh, the, the PDF uh, from, uh, I don't know, from Anna, maybe, or from Pietro. Huh? It's the yeah, same, I, same, same we're thing. We're having uh, some trouble sharing files in the chat, so maybe you can send them to us uh, with an email, maybe. Yeah, on, uh, with email, yeah. yes. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah I uh, will send it. And, and, and uh, also from Francesco. And uh, as I said, I'm more or less going. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for participating and thank you for um, everyone who... If, if there are questions it. or comments, uh, uh, I am always uh, ready to follow up. Eh? And I see also Andre, who is uh, in, uh, a student who will join us in the future from... Yeah, this is exactly uh, the, the cafeteria in, uh, in, in Lausanne, right? I think. Or anyway, yeah. the area in Lausanne. Yeah, yes. <laughs> okay. So, so see you soon and, and uh, bye to everyone. See you. Thank you bye. for joining us. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.